Um, good, let me say a few words by way of introduction. I do recognize some familiar names, but many are not familiar to me. So I'll just say a few words about the Insiders Outsiders project and uh, about myself. Um, I'm noticing family members coming in from the Bauman family, which is wonderful. Um, so my name is Monica Bomduch, and as you can see, I'm an art historian by training and profession uh, and the founding director of the Insiders Outsiders Project. And as some of you may know, it started off life as a year long face to face nationwide festival to celebrate the profound and diverse, you know, sort of pervasive contribution of those who came here mostly in the 1930s as refugees from Nazi Europe, but also those who came after the war and sometimes quite some time after the war in the case, as in the case of, of Zygmunt Bauman. And come COVID, we had to change tack as so many people did and we went online and this uh, event is one of many that has taken place since then. It is being recorded. So do um, uh, take a look at the Insiders Outsiders YouTube channel if you're interested in finding out more about what we have done by way of online events. But uh, more specifically tonight, this is being recorded. So if you could all please remain uh, muted for the moment if you have questions and I hope there will be questions and comments after our main speaker Janet has had her say you might want to type them into the chat in the first instance but I think because it's a relatively small group and hopefully an intimate event that actually meant you know I could invite you to unmute yourselves and we can we can kind of conduct the conversation um, verbally. Um, right what else um, I think no more than to say a very warm welcome to Janet and to members of the Bauman family sorry I'm just admitting people as we we go. Um, let me say a few brief words about Janet herself, as I think many of you will know, she's the co-editor of the very fascinating book about the photography of Zygmunt Bauman. Uh, her co-editor is actually not able to join us. He's based, I believe, in, in China, yes? Um, but he, he's, yes, uh, Peter Beilharz, the professor of, or a professor of critical theory at Sichuan University. Uh, Janet herself, um, I've much admired your work, Janet. I don't know if I ever told you that, you know, as a student, I was very much aware of your first sort of major publication, which I'll come to in a minute, The Social Production of Art, and found it immensely useful in my own, uh, you know, formation and studies as, as, a, as a youngster. Um, She's Professor Emerita at the School of Arts and Languages and Cultures at the University of Manchester, but she has a very sort of uh, uh, eminent career behind her. She joined Manchester University in 2006, having previously taught at the University of Leeds and also uh, in the United States. And I won't go on too much except to say that she has many books to her name. One of them I've already mentioned, The uh, Social Production of Art, also Aesthetics and the Sociology of Art, Feminine Sentences, Essays on Women and Culture, um, Anglo-modern, painting and modernity in Britain and the United States more recently, and the aesthetics of uncertainty, all of them fascinating in their different ways. I should also just add by way of conclusion here before handing over to Janet that she's also on her retirement from the university in 2010. She turned her hand to non-academic writing and I highly recommend her book. It's a very difficult book, isn't it, Janet, to, to pigeonhole and that's, I think, part of <laughs> what it's all about. It's called Austerity uh, Baby, published in 2017 and in her own words, it combines family history, memoir, mm -hmm. transatlantic reflections, and visual imagery. So enough <laughs> by way of introduction. I think uh, Janet will uh, agree and want me to, to continue. So, so I'm going to hand over to Janet, who will speak for approximately 40 minutes. That's the plan. We have, as I say, quite a few members of the Bauman family here, many of whom have contributed to a volume which, if some of you have already seen, it is intensely personal as well as analytical and, and thought-provoking in the light it sheds on somebody better known in a very different field of endeavour to photography. Um, and we'll see see how it goes. So we'll hopefully have some freewheeling and uh, interesting discussion afterwards. So over to you, Janet, with great pleasure. Thank you, Monica. And thank you for inviting me to join your wonderful series of lectures, which I keep an eye on um, all the time. It's been fascinating to do. I will screen share in just a moment. Um, but before I do, I just want to say, well, first of all, it's a little weird to be talking about um, Sigmund Bauman in front of his children, but I'm going to do it. It's lovely that Lydia's here. And Irena, I see you've managed to join us too. Um, and Anna um, Swad, I believe, I had a quick look around the room, so to speak, on my screen to see who I knew. Um, um, Griselda Pollock is just joining. She's in the book. Um, Anna, I just want to say, I know that you're um, tuning in, so to speak, from Israel, and I hope you're okay, and your family's okay, and your friends are okay, and we're thinking of you. It must yes. be really difficult for yeah. you all at the moment. It is. It is, yeah, and I'm, sure. I'm, I'm grateful sure. for this uh, 
possibility of having a little bit of escape. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's lovely to, well, I can't see you right now because I've, I've got the screen set up rather differently. But one thing I, I did want to mention, and I, I, Monica's reminded me that she did allude to this in the um, newsletter, is that two, two years ago or so, Lydia um, did one of these talks and she spoke about her mother, Janina Bauman, Sigmund's wife, of course. And I was present on that occasion and I found it a lovely and moving and extremely interesting talk. And I watched it again this weekend. And I, I would say maybe some of you were there. If you if you weren't there, I really recommend going on Monica's YouTube link um, to, to watch it. It's kind of a companion piece to this. But also, this talk is about Zygmunt Bauman's photographs. But as you'll see, it's going to be pretty centrally about Janina as well. And I'm going to try and explain explain why, why that's the case. So th th there's only very little overlap. Um, with what Lydia spoke about, um, and she knows a lot more than I do, of course, from family records and family history. So um, the three daughters are all here. I think uh, one or two others are here. Um, Carl, one, one of the grandchildren, Griselda, one or two other contributors. And some of you, I will be showing um, your, the work that you chose and talking a little bit about it. So I will screen share um, now, and I hope I will do this successfully. And I will go to slideshow. And I'm hoping that's the wrong one. Mm -hmm. Hoping that you can see um, the cover of the book. Uh, that's perfect, Janet. Is that good? Yeah. OK, this is the book. Um, and I think, by the way, Monica can tell us later that there's a possibility of a discount for anybody who's signed up for this talk to get the book. It's a Manchester University book in paperback. It's also, I probably shouldn't say this because we want it to sell, but it's it's available free, open access online. And I can provide that information on another occasion. So first, my Bauman credentials. I have known the family for 50 years, literally 50, almost to the month. Um, Sigmund came to England and came to Leeds, the University of Leeds in 1971. And he appointed me to my first academic position in Leeds in 1973. And I worked with him and got to know him and the family from then on. And I stayed there till 1988 when I went to the US, but stayed in touch um, through the years since then and until Zygmunt's um, death in 2017 and with the family since then. So it, it's a long history. And for that reason, this was a really lovely project for me to have the chance to, to get involved with. Um, ten family members are in the book, and a little bit later I'll explain how we went about putting this book together and how we thought it, it could best be organised and presented. So three daughters, um, six grandchildren and one grandson-in-law all have small pieces in each case in response to a single photograph in the book. When Monica introduced Lydia in that session a couple of years ago, um, she said in her opening remarks that Sigmund Bauman is pretty well known um, as a sociologist, a public intellectual, a philosopher, but Janina less so. So that was an opportunity to hear a lot about Janina's life, not just her importance in relation to Sigmund's life and work, but her own independent life and her own work. But I would say now that Sigmund Bauman is probably fairly well known, perhaps to many or most of you, but the fact that he did photography is less well known. And this is more or less a 10 year period of his life, pretty much the 1980s. Again, I'll say something about this in more detail about when he took it up and when he dropped it, but it was a, a 10 year period of very serious immersion in the practice of photography. And um, he did, took his own photographs, of course, he developed and printed them, he worked with Leeds Camera Club. Um, he learned his trade um, in, in, in great depth. He exhibited quite a lot and he um, submitted his work for competitions um, and won some prizes. I'll show you some of the prize um, certificates towards, towards the end of the talk. And then around the end of the 1980s, he just stopped doing photography. I believe towards the very end of his life, he died in 2017, he was, beginning to be a little bit interested in digital media and manipulation 
of the image on the computer. But we've concentrated on this, I'm thinking of it as his classic period of photography, the, the, the 1980s, more or less from 1980 to 1990. And a little bit later, I'll read a quote from him about, about taking it up. Here he is, randomly selected um, images, mostly from the internet. Um, so you're a little bit familiar with him, although his, his um, face is, is really very well known. Um, as his, his dates, born in 25 in Poland, in Poznan, and died in, I think, January 2017 in Leeds. He, uh, when I thought about it, he spent pretty much exactly half his life in England, in Leeds. Um, he came in 71, as I, I said before, um, after three years, uh, two, three years in Israel. Um, he moved into a house, Lord, famous Lawnswood Gardens, and I believe that black and white picture is taken there. Um, and he lived in he lived in that house until the day of his of his death. So um, the smoking theme, I mean, it's a bit of a joke, really, but as you'll see, I take it up in relation, and Irena will know what I'm talking about. Um, with regard to one of the photographs, but it's hard to see a picture of him without a pipe or sometimes a cigarette. And those who knew him will remember first that he was a very generous host and a great cook, and he gave um, very enjoyable dinner parties. But he was in the habit of saying after one of the courses, and now the next course will be passive smoking, and he and Yanina would light up, um, and they, they did that, um, I think, to the end, end of their lives. So the pipes and, and the smoke is, is really well known um, to the extent that here's a photograph, a, a, a cover of a, a late book, I think posthumously published actually, one of his conversation books uh, where you can barely see him for the smoke. And on the right um, is, is a very recent book. And it's one that I actually strongly recommend um, by Jack Palmer, who has a nice piece in our photography book actually. And I don't think has joined us today, although I can't now see who's in the room. Um, it's a it's an almost hot off the press update of knowledge about Zygmunt Bauman's work and life, reviews many of the debates about his work. It's really well written. Um, it's a page turner and it's really interesting. But it's here partly because there he is smoking again. And when he isn't smoking, the pipe is drawn in for him. This is one of three biographies that came out 2020, 2021, one um, in English, which I'll come on to in a minute and this one and another in Polish. And I think I'm right in saying that the title means exile, but again, Lydia or Irene or Anna can correct me later if it in fact doesn't mean exile. And here's a reverse thing, and this leads me into the book. No Zygmunt, but just the pipe and the smoke. So this is my co-editor with, with the current book, Peter Bilehartz. He lives in Melbourne in Australia, um, He's affiliated with and taught for many years at La Trobe University. And as Monica said, he's currently teaching in China, in Chengdu. So um, he couldn't come um, to this meeting, though he may watch the recording. And the book came about, this book was published. And as it happened, it's with Manchester University Press, who, as Monica mentioned, I think she mentioned, anyway, my memoir, Austerity Baby, had come out a year or two before it also with Manchester University Press. So my editor told me there's this new book by Peter Balhartz about Zygmunt, because I knew I would be interested. And I got it and read it, and I wrote to Peter and said how much I'd liked it. And he said, oh, I've just been reading your book, and I like that one too. And I was thinking of getting in touch to ask you if you'd be interested to do a book about Zygmunt's photographs. And I think I'm right in saying that th this idea came from, either came from Anna Svard, Zygmunt's daughter, Anna, you can tell me later about that, or just out of a conversation that Peter had with Anna. Anyway, I leapt at the chance and we started to think about it. The whole thing was done um, between us online and on Zoom, not only because he lived in Melbourne, but because it was COVID times. It was a really good COVID project. Um, and we started late 2020. And the book came out um, a, few, a few months ago in June of this year. Um, we didn't meet once during all that. In fact, I've only ever met him once, and that was at the launch of the Bauman Institute at the University of Leeds in um, 2010. So we worked on, on it together, um, and we talked about how best to do it. One challenge was to find the photographs, and we had a lot of help from the family. Um, 
many of us have photographs that because he took photographs of us and I'll, you'll see some of those in a minute um the bauman institute at the university of leeds has a, a huge archive and jack palmer put a lot of effort and time into helping us find them and snapshotting them and sending us um the body of them we put up all of them in dropbox so our contributors could choose among them and um, the daughters all had some and Irena in particular um put a lot of work into going into an archive in storage and finding a lot more photographs so it was kind of random but out of all that we got a, a big trove of a real variety of, and of some excellent photographs which in the end was, was going to make a, a book and the idea we had was um, if possible, to involve the family if they were willing and ask a number of people to choose one photograph each and write for the facing page no more than 500 words that would fit on the page. So a, a good part of the book, and it's interspersed um, among some longer essays, is 14 of those, including one each by myself and Peter Bailhartz. One photograph and 500 words inspired by the photograph, more or less directly or indirectly um, engaging with the photograph and alongside that we um, commissioned a few longer essays and I, um, I'll say something about some of those as, as I go along um, so that's that's the structure of the book and, and it worked really well and then we realized there were quite a few photographs that we both really liked and nobody had chosen them and they weren't in the longer essays so we've got a section of eight black and white plates in the book on um, full full um, page images of those photographs that we wanted to be in the book anyway. So I'm not going to spend any time really on Zygmunt's life and work, only to speak really, really briefly about it so that I can get onto the, the photographs. This bi biography, um, this is the English language one I mentioned by Isabella Wagner is an excellent biography um, and very comprehensive. She, um, I think, isn't able to join us today. I didn't hear back from her, but she is in the book. And her essay in the book is actually about Janina. It's about Janina's work in the film industry in Warsaw after the war, because we broadened our scope a little bit into visual culture, not just photography, partly because Sigmund was interested in film. There's an essay on that too, and partly because it was important that um, we talked about Janina. So um, everything is there in Isabella's um, biography, pretty pretty up to date. Um, the, Zygmunt's birth, um, early years um, in Poland, childhood, exile during the war when the Germans came. Um, first, first of all, east towards the east of Poland, and and then um, in Russia, a year's service, active service um, in the Polish division of the Red Army, I believe, and work in political education in that time. Um, including in the Internal Security Corps. And then about his life in Poland, um, political and academic af after the war. Um, and there's plenty to say about that. And some of you may have come across some of the debates um, which were reported on in the press, which have more, in my opinion, to do with the rise of nationalism and anti-Semitism in Poland in recent years than anything to do with what actually happened with Zygmunt's work. Um, in the Internal Security Corps. Um, just to say one thing about that, um, very late in Zygmunt's life, he came to give a talk in Manchester, and I went along to hear it, and before he spoke, uh, a group of young men got up, and Polish young men from Manchester, and started yelling. I had no idea what they were talking about, um, but I gather that happened from time to time, and it, it was a way accusing him of um, early communist affiliations and activities, but um, it, it's a complicated story. Um, it's, an, it's another story um, and a bit of a sad one, really. Um, also sad, but more important and now more relevant is that in 1968, the Baumanns had to leave um, Poland in a hurry um, as a result of the anti-Semitic purges and anti-Semitic anti activities in that year, something that Lydia also talks about in, in her talk about Janina. Um, and they left secretly at night and quickly, and went first to Israel, where um, Zygmunt worked, as I said, for three years at the university, I think Tel Aviv and Haifa, but um, I can't remember. I actually first met him there on a brief visit before I even went to Leeds. 
And then he came to Leeds um, in 71 and worked there until his retirement, the age of 65 in 1990. Um, um, he first returned to Poland um, 20 years later, 1988. Um, um, and there are many things to say about his return and his experience of that. And maybe um, the others will talk about that if there's time. The other book, I, I don't want to say much about it. It's a slightly peculiar book. Um, some of it consists of a, um, a private autobiography that he wrote in 1987, intended for his daughters and his family. Um, and uh, it's accompanied in the book with a number of essays, which are also partly autobiographical, originally published in Polish. And this is also a pretty new book, only came out um, a few months ago. So it's his own reflections on his life, talking about particularly his childhood and, and his early life. Um, and and it, it's um, it is also worth reading as a sort of companion to Isabella's um, very substantial and detailed and um, documented study. About his work, um, I can't really speak about his work. He wrote probably 70 books, and certainly more than 60. He's known um, most particularly for the ones you see in the middle about liquid, liquid society, liquid love, liquid times. If you read from left to right, um, that's kind of thematically how it works. So the early books were on aspects of culture, culture as practice, socialism, and so on. Then a focus on the nature of modernity. Um, and then um, soon the idea of postmodernity, that is a culture that's more and more fragmented um, and its discontents. Many, several books with postmodernity in the title. And then um, in the later years, and I think this is this is predominantly after retirement in 1990, when you're still only 65. The idea of the liquid, which is perhaps best known, that society is liquid, all the solid structures have gone, all the habits have changed, um, everything's in flux. I'm, I'm vastly simplifying here. Um, and then a, a, a one or two one-off, sometimes shorter books about the global situation, about refugees, strangers at our door, can't actually see my one on the right because I've got everybody's photographs in front of it now, um, but wasted lives about modernity and its outcasts and so on. So quite wide ranging um, continuities, which one could um, draw out if there were time. Um, and at the, towards the end of his life, a lot of his books were dialogue books, like the one that I showed you before um, with the smoke coming out of the pipe. Um, in other words, he'd have um, a relationship with a, an, another academic or perhaps a journalist some of them Italian, he's very big in Italy, and by the way, in South America, um, on a theme, on literature or on, on something else. And, and in fact, just a few months before he died, he wrote to me to ask if I would consider doing a dialogue book with him. He said um, it would be, I'll just quote from the email, a conversation addressed not to fellow academics, but to culture's practitioners and to cultural practices objects. And it never happened. I'm, I'm not sure um, how far we would have got with that. We thought we would just think about it and correspond. But then, I mean, it was he was getting ill and um, I think it, it was dropped and perhaps it would have never happened. But the dialogue books, some of them are really fascinating. His, his answers to the questions are all, all, always worth reading. There are many, many books about him. Um, and um, this is really just a very small sample of those to show you the kinds of topics that are taken up, photographs. There isn't actually, oh, there's one pipe, yes. Um, and um, just uh, a range of ones, Peter Bilehart's has one there. I have an essay in the liquid sociology one that's on the top right that Mark Davis edited. Um, he won, got, was awarded with many prizes for his work, the Amalfi Prize in, 1989, the Adorno Prize, 1998, Spanish Prize of Prince of Astorius in 2010. And he had, I think, 20 or so honorary doctorates. And i just show you two more um, book covers. The reason I'm showing the one on the left is that that photograph is by Sigmund Bauman. Not much is said about it. Actually, nothing said about it in the book, except credits of Sigmund Bauman for taking the photograph. Um, so that was 1992, um, and I don't actually know how that came about. And that was the first public appearance of a, of a photograph by Zygmunt Baum, but as I said, nobody made anything about it. The book on the right is a Polity Press book, fairly recent, 
and it's one of three um, edited collections by a number of people connected with the Bauman Institute of unpublished essays by Sigmund Bauman, so far unpublished essays. And I'm showing you that one because it includes an essay on photography um, called Thinking Photographically. And what the editors have done is put together fragments of things that Sigmund had written um, in connection with um, applications for showing his work, just reflections on photography, other things, and put them together into a, a sort of an essay. That is to say, his, his thoughts on, on photography. Um, I'll quote actually from what Sigmund says about that, which we reproduced in, in the introduction to our book about how he, how he started to do photography. And this, this is taken from what they say in this book. I took up photography fairly recently and virtually by accident. Traveling abroad, I used to make sketches of fine monuments of architecture that I wished to remember. But sketching took time. Worse still, looking at the products of my efforts, I couldn't help to wonder what was so fine about my objects to inspire me in the first place. So for a trip to Germany in September, 1980, I bought a compact Rico to do the sketching for me. Again, contemplating the bleak and dreary output of trade processing and printing, I struggled in vain to recapture my past ecstasies. And then I saw in the window of a lo local photo shop, a used Russian enlarger for 15 pounds. Perhaps if I tinkered with the negatives myself, I could in the end get out from the camera exactly what went into it at the beginning. And so I bought the enlarger and thus my photographic life began. That, that was 1980. So 1980 was also a time when he was fairly disillusioned with university life, with academic life in general. Photography was a new interest and a big passion really. And as I said, it occupied him at least for 10 years. And at the end of that 10 years, and I will come on to the photographs in a second, um, a couple of things happened. One, he retired. He was free to do whatever he wanted. He, he retired in 1990. But two, he wrote this book, 1989, Modernity and the Holocaust, which was transformative, both in relation to how his work was seen and possibly in relation to his own thoughts about that. And this is going to lead me now to talk about Janina. Um, this book, I think if people know one book about by Zygmunt Bauman, it might well be this book. Um, and then on the 20th anniversary of it, um, would have been, there was a conference and I think um, Griselda who's here and Jack and various other people, um, uh, Lydia, I think you have a, have a piece in it. This is, this I believe is the volume that was a product of the conference, which was revisiting this book after decades. So Jack, Jack Palm is one, one of the editors, um, Griselda, Jack, um, Isabella, Lydia, and others are all in it. Now, the book, um, was it, as Sigmund says on the very first page of its preface, was inspired by Janina, and this is why. And here I link up with what Lydia said a couple of years ago. Their lives were separate until the war. They met after the war, um, and they were married from, I think, 1948 until Janina's death in 2009. And these are the first book by Janina. There are two editions of it here on the left. Winter in the Morning was her memoir of being in the Warsaw Ghetto during the war. So before she met, met Sigmund, she was young, she was a teenager. Two editions of that book. And then two years later, um, a second memoir, A Dream of Belonging, her years in post-war Poland, Poland, which also cover her meeting with, with Sigmund and their escape later on um, from Poland. And the book on the right combines those um, books um, with a later edition. But they're, they're, these are all Virago, by the way. And so what Sigmund said was, um, in, in the preface to his book, yes, of course I knew about the Holocaust, but I never really understood it until I read Janina's book. So I think she, again, the, the, the daughters can confirm this. She didn't speak much about this until she wrote it. And he said, having read Janina's book, I began to think just how much I did not know, or rather did not think about properly. It dawned on me that I didn't really understand what had happened in, as she said, that, that world which was not mine, because um, th that was what Janina said about Sigmund, um, about the world which was not his. What did happen was far too complicated to be explained in a simple, intellectually comforting way, I naively imagined sufficient. I realised the Holocaust was not only sinister and horrifying, 
but also an event not at all easy to comprehend in habitual, ordinary terms. Um, and so he goes on to explain why he was inspired to write the, the book Modernity and the Holocaust. Um, I've always been, oh, don't miss an opportunity to tell people this, but really proud that I was the first reader of Yanina's first chapter. And this is her dedication to the copy of the book that she gave me when it first came out. She called herself Jane in those days in Leeds. Um, so um, I was had the honour of, of reading the first draft of the first chapter of Winter in the Morning. So that's a treasured possession for me. Here are some pictures of Janina. I think, Lydia, you showed the one on the left in your talk, if I'm remembering right. Um, and I, here are some little bit of smoking going on as well, but that wasn't why I included those, just to in, introduce mm -hmm. you to Janina um, in, in person here. And these are a couple that we reproduced in the book. I've assumed that um, Zygmunt took these by setting up the camera. I can't think how else they happened. And again, again, perhaps others can enlighten me on that. But some lovely ones of them sitting together. I think it's probably their old Amstrad computer, but I'm not sure. And then on the stairs at Lawn Lawnswood Garden with a Don Quixote behind them. And I've used that, that one on the right in my essay where I talk a little bit about the importance of Don Quixote in, in Zygmunt's writing. But that also is another story. So now Zygmunt's photographs, proper, proper ones. This is one of, of Janina, a very beautiful one, I think. And it's one that was chosen by um, Hannah Bauman Lyons, Irena's daughter, who herself works in and sells ceramics and pottery. So it's, it's a lovely coincidence that she was able to choose this photograph and, and write about it. I think, I've assumed that that is one of Janina's parts that she's sitting next to, but it's a, lo a lovely photograph. And another one of her, um, this one on the, on the left was chosen by Anna, Anna's daughter, Emmy Svard, to, to write about, but by complete coincidence, and at least from my point of view, it's a lovely coincidence, look at the one on the right. Um, Carl Dudman is here in, in the meeting today, and the last essay in the book, and he's a, one of the grandsons, Lydia's son, actually, um, the last essay in the book is a lovely essay by him about the house, a series of photographs that he took in the house shortly after Zygmunt's death, but before the house was sold. And I've just chosen, there are many of them in, in, in the book, just walking around the house and taking pictures of how it was laid out. But it's a nice coincidence that here's a wall with the very photograph that we've included that was written about in the book, and you can read it in the book, by Emmy. And my last word on smoking, sorry about this, Irena, but I just wanted to put this one in and I'm going to quote you without asking your permission. This is Irena, and she chose this photograph to, to write about, and I need to find it and tell you what she says about it, since I've been making quite a thing here about smoking um, and so on. Just really briefly, a couple, of, a couple of brief things from it. Smoking, this is Irena, smoking and the act of photographic snapshot arguably share some characteristics. Both are driven by desire, both need tools of implementation and a moment in time to execute the act. Both are props to daily sorrows, special celebrations, tools of mediation within relationships. Both can be repeatedly enacted and both can be highly annoying and intrusive to others. Both can leave us with rich re recollections. M many other things, all, all of it fascinating, but one more bit I'll read you. The act of smoking with my mother and my father was synonymous with conversation, illuminating insights into politics and the human condition, made lighter with the telling and retelling of Jewish jokes retrieved from the rich catalogue of my father's memory in intact condition. I think that, that's lovely. And it, it's just very nice to have included that in the, in the book. Um, here, maybe I should be apologising to Griselda, but Griselda, you and I did choose these photographs also in our various essays. So um, Sigmund photographed us both. We were colleagues in the 80s. Here we both are, each are, in case it's not obvious, I'm the one on the left, Griselda's the one on the right, 40 years ago. Um, so he would take many people, most people who were willing, upstairs to his studio, and uh, we have a photography session. I lived almost next door in, in those years, I mean, two minutes walk away from Lawnswood Gardens. The many, many, many examples of photographs of, of friends and colleagues and family members of this. And here are just two. The double portraits are interesting. Um, the one on the right, um, Griselda, I haven't been able to see if Tony's here with you, but 
Tony, Griselda and Tony Bryant wrote a long essay together that's in the book. And these are Tony's parents, Paul and Leonie Bryant. Um, refugees, I think I'm right in saying um, Leonie from Germany, from Berlin, and Paul Bryant from Czechoslovakia. Again, Griselda, correct me later if that's wrong. On the left, also refugees, Hans and Bibi Schwarzmantel, the parents of my friend, still my friend and colleague at Leeds, John. Um, they were both um, from Vienna, refugees from Vienna. And um, there are other examples of double portraits in, in the archive. These are two that are, are in the book. The, the one on the left is the one I actually chose to write my 500 words about. And just wanted to give you an example of, of how a double portrait might look. I think they're both wonderful compositions and wonderful creations and presentations of character of the people in, the, in these images. Quite a few of the um, in photographs are like snapshots of street scenes. And there's some debate to be had really about whether this was a kind of surrogate sociology for Sigmund, since he was not writing that much sociology, certainly not this kind of sociology. In fact, Jack Palmer's essay in the book is the one that addresses this the most directly. And he has some interesting things to say about that. But here I'm just showing them because I think they're great photographs. One on the left is the one that Lydia chose to write about. The one on the right, Griselda and Tony have written about in the book. Um, and some other street scenes. This one we just included in our group of eight photographs that are not written about. Interesting that it's got a title and we've, we can only conclude that this one and one or two others were given titles for exhibitions. But the archive is kind of messy. And although there are a couple of lists of images in relation to an exhibition, it's not really easy to match the images to what actually happened in the exhibition. Um, and most of the most of the photographs don't have dates and don't have titles. Um, so don't look for that in the book. This one, um, I have it in my longer essay. And we, as you know, we by now we chose it for the cover. I just I think it's a really striking image. I did wonder whether, if anything, links to sociology, so there's something a bit liquid about this encounter. Uh, who knows? I mean, in any case, it looks like a something rather transient, um, but it, it's interesting and visually it's quite arresting, I think, and that, that's why that's there. Um, this one, I think this one, yes, I, this one is used by Lydia um, as one of three in a catalog essay she wrote for an exhibition of Sigmund's photographs um, in, nine, in 2010. I think it was in conjunction with the opening of the Bauman Institute at the University of Leeds. Um, and I'm just showing you here because it's just a, a, another nice image to show you. Um, and we reprinted Lydia's essay um, in the book from the, the 2010 exhibition. This one, it's sorry, it's photographed through glass, so it's not a great image. It is in the book in be better quality because we took it out from this one um, is a treasured possession of mine. Um, in the week after Sigmund's death, a number of us with the family and a couple of close friends, Griselda was there too, gathered in Lawnswood Gardens one last time. Um, and the daughters uh, uh, invited me to choose a photograph that I'd like to keep. It's This is a small one, it was on the stairs. Actually, in Carl's es photo essay at the end of the book, there's one um, image where you can see this photograph on the, on the staircase, on the wall of the staircase um, in the house. So this is a Yorkshire Mill, I don't know which and I don't know where, but it's a really lovely picture and it's on my wall as I speak. And then a few of the extras. This is one of my favourites. I don't think anybody wrote about it. This one um, is also one of my favourites, written about by um, Anna's son, Michael Svard, who's a human rights lawyer in Israel. And he has a really nice piece reflecting on the meaning of the gate and the space behind the gate um, and so on. I think that's all I want to show you by way of um, images. Oh, a couple of extra ones, sorry. This one, um, Peter loved, so he's put it in his essay. I don't think he talks about it much, but it's a funny picture. Um, so Sigmund Bauman was exhibiting quite a bit, a number of times in Leeds, um, later on also in Poland. And I see the one on the right is a much more recent one also in, in Poland. Um, and um, there, there were a number of exhibitions, thematic um, and, and general, over those years and during the active period of photography. And then, as I said, he got certificates of merit and prizes in a number of places. The one on the left, 19th place, 
was accompanied by a letter telling him he'd been awarded this, and it said, I can tell you that to finish in the top 20 is no mean feat. So I hope that he was proud of that. I mean, he did, it was a very successful photographic career. And then, as I said, he just stopped. He said he'd reached his limits. He, he was not, um, um, interested in the, the new technologies of um, digital um, photography and so on. I'm just looking to see if Monica's sending me a, a message in the chat. That's actually to unmute. No, I don't think so. Um, and he decided to start. But as, as I said, it coincided absolutely with his retirement, with the modernity and the Holocaust, and with a whole new energy, a whole new life of writing. I think he wrote most of his books in his retirement years, or the liquid books and so on. Um, um, in, in the book also, just before I close, I'll just say a couple more things about it. Um, Keith Tester, I think you saw one of his books in the array of books about Bauman, died um, rather young, a couple of years, and rather suddenly after Zygmunt. He was very close to the Bauman family and wrote a lot about Zygmunt. And he had written a, a very interesting essay about the, Sigmund and film on Bauman and Bergman, and we got permission to reproduce that essay in, in the book. So that, that's in the in in the book as well. Jack Palmer's essay, um, which is partly about some photographs that Sigmund took in a residency in Newfoundland, uh, where he spent a semester in, in the later 1980s. That was also an interesting essay. We um retrieved and reprinted an essay by Sigmund himself from the Jewish Quarterly. Um, in 1989 about a Polish woman photographer called, the essay was called The War Against Forgetfulness. It's a, a, she photographed um, old grave, gravestones and so on in various areas. Um, so we got permission to reproduce an essay by Sigmund Bauman in the book. As I said, we, we produced um, Lydia's catalogue essay, Isabella's essay on um, Janina's work in the film industry. Um, and, and I think those are those are the main things. I think um, I want to end by quoting Janina. It's, we quote it in the book. Lydia also quotes it in her catalogue essay. But it's a, a lovely piece, if I can find it, um, from Janina's second book, where she's talking about Zygmunt's their life together in Leeds and Zygmunt's new interest in photography. And I think this because I've wanted to link what I say about Zygmunt with Janina through the modernity and the Holocaust connection the photographs of Janina and the fact that she is very central to the book. I'm going to end here with her words. So this is from Dreams of Belonging. I watch him now, bent over his photographs, my protector, my friend, my love. His hair has turned grey. His face bears signs of a hard life, but his eyes are the same. They still burn with passion. Busy all day with his teaching, he still finds the time, strength and will to work on his new art. It came so late in his busy life, he feels he has to hurry. So, even after a tiring day, he stays up late at night to add a final touch to his unusual prints. And I, I'll end there with Janina's words, and I hope I've left time for um, the Bauman family to speak and others to speak. Thank you. I'll stop screen sharing. Thank you so much, Janet. As fully expected, that was insightful and wonderfully intimate um, at the same time. Um, I have obviously some things I would like to broach and ask, but I think looking at the time, perhaps we should indeed invite other people intimately connected to Zygmunt and his photography to say a few words. I mean, perhaps the obvious question you very fleetingly touched on was this, you know, in a way it's it's too obvious. Is it too obvious? I'm not sure. But, you know, the relationship perhaps as he saw it, but also as other people see it in Griselda, I'm thinking perhaps you're the perfect person to enter the discussion here, you know, between his life as a sociologist, as a thinker, and as a photographic practitioner, was you know what what do you perceive the relationship, the dynamic between the two activities to be? I mean, Janet, I don't know if you want to start perhaps by saying a little bit more about that, and then maybe hand over if Griselda would like to comment further. Indeed, any other members of the family or anybody else for that matter? Let me let others respond to that. All I've said was that, um, that I've, I've seen them as very separate. Um, I think that's probably he thought that he wasn't even that kind of sociologist, empirical sociologist, mm. where you go and actually describe streets. Mm. But one can see his sociological eye in the way that he captured something in an image. But maybe maybe when Griselda chose one of those photographs and Lydia did. So I'd like to know what they might say. 
I don't want to force anybody into an awkward position, but maybe... I think everybody's muted, aren't they? Uh, you can unmute yourself, Griselda, um, if you would like to enter the discussion now, or, or Lydia, for that matter. Or I, any... think, I think it's a question for Griselda. Griselda, can Yes, I, I suspect it is. <laughs> Griselda, you're very silent. Um, as I said, I don't want to put you on the spot in any, in any way. I mean, thinking about the images, just perhaps while we're waiting for Griselda, you know, I was very struck. I mean, some interesting things going on. You know, obviously, as some of you will know, I'm the daughter of a professional photographer, somebody who came to this country at a very tender age and trained as a photographer. In fact, in Manchester, where, where um, Janet is now based and, and, you know, worked for over 70 decades. And that was very much her, her life. It was never a side activity in the way that it clearly was for Zygmunt. But this idea of transience, liquidity, the Holocaust, loss, I just, you know, I'm just throwing these ideas open because I mean, one of the things that photography can do, even when slightly manipulated, and I'm curious to know if anybody else could throw some light on exactly what Zygmunt did in that dark room to, to work with the images. But that aside, I mean, obviously they're capturing an instant of time and that certainly in my mother's thinking about the medium was its unique ability to stop time in its tracks, to actually stop liquid time as it were to stop transience in its tracks and i'm just you know i'm sort of thinking out loud in a sense but i wonder if anybody would like to comment on, on that at all i can't tell who's still here because everybody's replaced their live picture with images so i don't know if i think Lydia's Let's go to the here. gallery view so i can see better who's who's still around oh okay uh, uh, lydia yes the other lydia i wondered lydia go whether you'd like to chip oh, in hi, this hi lydia <laughs> I'll, I'll, unmute yourself lydia and i'll spotlight you so everybody can see you I can't actually talk. I have COVID. So oh, I'm sorry I, to hear it. A lot of people I, do. A lot of people I, I, do. I, I've known Janet for so long and adore her work. She is absolutely brilliant. <laughs> and this project, which I've been reading with great pleasure, is also wonderful. So, but more I can't say at the moment. Nice to <laughs> see you, Lydia. Get better. Get better quickly. Okay. Uh, yes, do 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 get better quickly, indeed. Okay. Indeed. Um, can I just say, Monica, that... Yes, of course. Where's where's the other lady? Hold on, let me find you. Um, well, Thank you very much. Um, a lovely exposition. It's always very touching to revisit uh, some of the stories of our father in whatever form they might take. Um, but the, the, the question about uh, ECS sociology in his phot photographs, I, I mean, I can't comment uh, perhaps as, uh, um, you know, as, 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 as well as perhaps Griselda could have done, but one of the exhibition catalogues that you showed uh, early one with his hand as uh, in the photograph um, was called um, I think pictures and words and words and pictures and I I'm pretty sure at some point he did say that um, he was making visible uh, his ideas in sociology I think he's, he may have said that privately at some point so there was there was some connection in his mind uh, and the very fact that he was looking at uh, people um, in social situations in urban situations um, touching on 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 the, on the ideas of uh, of anonymity and and separation even in groups things like that were things which interested him so i think that there's definitely some connection we can't completely separate them mm. no no how could you exactly and i'm very struck also just in purely terms of the visual response you know this kind of interesting tension or contrast in many of the pictures all across the board perhaps when you look at his his work you know between a wry kind of humour, observational humour, and a tremendous poignancy. You know, there's that sort of interesting, but it's complicated relationship between the two. Um, well, listen, I don't want to dominate the conversation. Lydia, I don't know if you wanted to say anything. I don't know whether you'd be the person to say something about his technique. I mean, obviously, he was doing things in that dark room. <laughs> he, was, he, he was doing things in that dark room. <laughs> the dark room was actually the pantry, wasn't it? I just divulged it. Yeah, it doesn't matter, yeah. <laughs> The, the, the dark room, the forbidden place in our house in Lonswood Gardens, <laughs> um, was yes, was essentially a pantry, and it was full of jam jars and and <laughs> cornflakes. And my my father always it was uh, very similar to his working conditions at home because he chose the very smallest room in the entire house, and he was uh, for his writing, and he was perched on the most uncomfortable stool, not even a, a chair with a back, um, on on the typewriter and. Like, Later, of course, there was a computer with his pipe tobacco always littering the keyboard. And I mean, just so uncomfortable, so somehow minima, minimal. Um, and the same thing went for his so-called dark room. It was a pantry full of jam jars and other things. Um, and he just uh, worked out a little, a little shelf 
on which he arranged the you know the box with the with the acid and I don't know I never went in there because it was just all very frightening but um and not exactly allowable and that's where he functions so yes he disappeared and he reappeared with these amazing things um, and I always thought that it was so strange that um I mean you, you mentioned that there was some some uh, uh, course uh, of, um, of 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 learning that he and he went to the, these photographers clubs and things, but in some ways his best work seems to have come out um, fully fledged, you know, like 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 Aphrodite out of the head of Zeus, fully fledged, ready to arrive on the shore on the on the seashell <laughs> in its entirety. I mean, his, it, there was there didn't seem to be that moment when he was developing his ideas. He kind of just became. And came came out with with his very inimitable voice, um, and that was that was a strange thing, but but as you mentioned, the passion for photography was uh, as short as every other passion. I mean, not every other passion, but some of the other passions that he had, for instance, for making uh, making wine. Uh, maybe it was a good thing that his that passion uh, waned after a while because <laughs> those vats of wine were not not exactly um, you know great but um, but but that's he, he had these sort of passing phases but I think the photography was definitely his most uh, uh, interesting one for him and came out of his love of drawing as well I remember he used to draw quite a lot he had sketchbooks uh, and drew things out of you know with charcoal and was also very knowledgeable about art history which is, which is my subject he knew a lot about it and he we sometimes had really interesting conversations about uh, various periods in art history. He, he just knew it all. Mm -hmm. <laughs> do, do, do you know whether he did take up in, in any real way digital photography or on-screen manipulation of the image? Yeah, I um, think I'd heard, I'd heard that and we saw a couple of examples, but I'm not sure whether that was just nothing, something trivial. It's in, I think, most primitive uh, ways. I mean, you could, you could get some of those uh, sort of bits of software where you could manipulate the image and make it look like an impressionist painting or something. But that was just playing around. That wasn't serious, obviously. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It was just curious. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I remain curious about, you know, just the technical aspect. I want to go on about it too much. And I don't know whether Anna's being the elder sister might be able to throw more light on that because, you know, at first sight, they look very much like the Cartier Bresson, you know, capturing the instant kind of image. And that's, you know, why they you know, had an innate sense of composition. They worked tremendously well, but I'm just curious to know what, as I say, what he got up to in the darkroom to actually alter the original image, because clearly he wasn't, he said, that quote you gave, you know, that he wasn't satisfied with well, the I image at said, first. I should have said, actually, when when I told you the little bit about yeah. the family coming to um, England, Anna stayed in Israel, and she... Yes, and she, actually, I did know that, of course. Yeah, I, yes, 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 and she's been there to this very day, so she wasn't right there on the spot all the time, but frequent visitor. But I Anna, Anna, I'd love to know what you have to say about yeah. this or anything. Here. Yeah, I don't have much to say about my father's technique when it comes to photography. Yeah. Some yeah. other techniques like uh, a person of education, I could say quite a lot about it, but this is not our theme. But I was taken by what, uh, by what Monica um, mentioned in passing, that is the connection between photography time and on the other mm -hmm. end of the spectrum, liquidity. Mm -hmm. uh, our father was a kind of, you know, it's strange to say such a thing about a person who wrote about postmodernity, but he was a freak of stability, of permanence, mm -hmm. of consistency, mm -hmm. of predictability. And photography was a kind of, you know, please moment stay. I will froze the, the moment, I will, I will freeze the moment, sorry. I It will stay with me forever and so on. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, father was doing photography much more energetically and with a greater passion than his writing, which was unusual. So this decade Janet was talking about um, when he was um, passionately um, practicing photography was also the decade when he told me in a personal conversation that he in fact finished with sociology. He no longer feels he has something to say in sociology. So I think that his transition from photography to modernity and Holocaust and liquidity above everything else was a kind of debacle when his attempts to freeze the moment mm -hmm. gave up to his resignation. Mm -hmm. He res resigned himself to the fact that the world is liquid and this is what he was talking about now. And this, this kind of inversion, if you wish, uh, going to the opposite of photography, 
gave a new lease of life to his sociology. And so, do, you, do you agree that it's not accidental that it coincided with retirement? Absolutely. Mm. He, he suddenly felt free. Uh, he was quite unhappy as a person of university, both because he was uh, disillusioned with academia and because he was um, uh, forced, I mean, not forced, but uh, as a person of academia with the highest um, university ranks of professor, full professor, he had to fulfill many administrative uh, functions, which he simply hated. This is not too strong a word. Mm -hmm. So um, going, uh, freeing himself from all these obligations uh, gave also probably another push to, so this is a combination. It was my mother's book, certainly. It was his being free again. It is because of his thinking, which assisted his doing photography, that probably had this effect. And I meant to say another thing. You know, I showed you earlier on, alongside Isabella's biography, Zygmunt's own so-called autobiography, that piece he wrote for you, for the daughters, that's in that book. I think that was um, an, also a response to Janina's book and Absolutely. just thinking about Jewishness. Yeah. Because it was written privately, none of us saw it at the time. It was 1987. Later on, you agreed to circulate it and apparently you agreed to have it published. But I think that was that same moment um, about Virago publishing Janina, Sigmund coming towards retirement, then writing Modernity in the Holocaust. So um, there are connections there that are really interesting to think about. I agree. Yes, Anna, thank you very much. That was a very valuable contribution. Now I'm looking, scanning the, the audience. Uh, as I said, I don't want to put anybody on the spot, but if any other members of the family, or did anybody else who has read the book, looked at the pictures, knew Zygmunt or not, Janina, likewise, you know, would like to come in at this point, you'd be most welcome. If you would just put up your hand or maybe just unmute yourself and, and have your say. I noticed Carl, Carl, I am going to put you in the spot. I know you've not been well, but if you're feeling well enough, uh, Carly, do, no, no, okay. But I mean, you've got COVID, it's a very good excuse. Um, I did think that Carl's photo essay was intensely moving. Nice to see you, Carl, anyway. A lovely kind Hello. of coda, coda to the book. Mm. I can, <clears throat> um, yes, I am uh, also afflicted, unfortunately. Um, I can, uh, yes, I mean, if you have a question. <laughs> Um, I'm happy to answer if I if I can. Um, Would you say yeah. something about taking those photographs? Yeah, um, I should, sure, I should absolutely. Just, why not? Mm -hmm. Yes, well, um, uh, yes, well, um, yeah, I, I think as I mentioned it in the in the book, it, it wasn't really ever something that I imagined was going to be uh, something that was going to end up in a book. Um, the, the whole project um, started off as a, as a very personal exercise. Um, it was in 2017 when uh, my grandfather had, had just died um, and I was in, in the house um, and very quickly realised that um, this was going to be the exact moment from which point uh, the house, which is an in intensely important and evocative place uh, for the family, was going to gradually disintegrate um, and bits and pieces would be sort of carried off in different directions and and eventually it would be sold off and, and, and um, you know, have a new life and a new family. And I realised that that was actually um, a really important part of my relationship with, with both of my grandparents and my childhood as the youngest of, of the uh, cousins. Um, it, I spent sort of relatively less time with my grandparents and with others uh, than, than other cousins did. So the house was a really sort of strong um, association for me. And so I, I resolved, even though I was living not in Leeds, but uh, at that time in Oxford, I resolved to go back, get my camera and, and come back with it to just have a, a few moments with just me alone with the house to photograph it and to try to really pull out the the associations. And, and they are very, very personal ones. There's, there's one image, I actually can't remember if it made it into the book, uh, which is a real close-up of of the the carpet on the on the the first floor, um, which was very very coarse for anyone who remembers it, and and would leave an imprint on your foot as you it. as you walk over it. That's it, yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's not a coincidence that 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 I chose that angle because I really you know that that carpet was part of the, my kind of most effective 
um, memory of, of being in that house, walking around barefoot until we got told off for, for not having socks on um, and feeling the imprint of that carpet on, on our little children feet. So um, that was really part of that process was really initially just a very personal exercise and my own way of dealing with with losing, uh, you know, now the, the second of, of those two grandparents and, and the last of all of my grandparents. Um, but in time, I think it, it grew to have an importance for, for the whole family because nobody had, uh, I, I don't think anyone had really, really thought to do that. Um, and so I then reproduced it for, for the rest of the family. And then, and then in the end, it became, you know, a subject of interest for, for this book, obviously, because also because he was a, a very photographed man as well as being a photographer and the house itself was was a, an important backdrop for a lot of uh the those iconic pictures of him you know surrounded by books all yellowing and faded um so yeah I mean I was glad that that it ended up having a role to play in the book but uh, as I say in the essay it was it was a bit of a quandary for me how public it should become the the series because not obviously it started off as quite a personal thing but also it was personal of of him and of my grandparents of the family so how how um public to go with these these images but you, you know you can read that and explore what i concluded if you, if you fancy but uh yeah that that's maybe a little bit about the background to that essay thank you carly for somebody with covid uh, you've been very very eloquent can i perhaps again at the risk of putting you on the spot but you know you're obviously a very keen photographer yourself i've seen your work and it's very impressive how i mean this is this is perhaps silly but you know i mean if you had to sum up what photography means for you and perhaps think about that in relation to your grandfather's work as a photographer i wonder if there's anything interesting that might be you know extracted from that uh yeah, well, I've often wondered myself. Uh, it's not something we ever talked about together. Um, I actually scarcely even knew that he had ever even picked up a camera until um, the opening of the Bauman Institute when I was just asked to put together a little um, a slideshow of some of his um, photographs to go on a, on a screen in the background somewhere. And then even for the, the remaining, I think, seven years of his life, we, we never really talked about it. So you know, I, I've also gone through that process of trying to figure out what photography meant to him. Was it a, an exercise in sociology or just something very, uh, you know, um, un, unadorned and un, un intellectual? Um, uh, and and I can't be sure any more than anyone else can. But um, you know, I think for me, for me, it it is quite it's a very impulsive um uh thing to do um I, I get the impression that it was a little bit that for him as well just from looking at the the images but you know the the entire enjoyment and excitement of photography for me it takes place in the moment that the, that the shutter goes it, it you know i hate all of the admin that follows the editing the post-production stuff it's all it becomes a drag from then it, it's just from, from that point on it's it's mostly about just seeing the world uh, watching the world and 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 seeing things that 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 seem to me as though they want their picture taking um and and you know so i guess it is a little playful in that respect um and whilst i can't talk much about what we had in common in terms of our motiv motivations him and me uh, i do get the impression that there, that there is a, a playfulness in 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 his motivation as well uh, always standing by waiting for something interesting to happen on the street or uh, and, and the other the, the 500 word essay uh snap um, response to one of his photos that i did was was one such where you can really see his sort of sense of humor coming through in, in that image um so yeah i think there was something improvisatory and and quite sort of on the spot about uh about his photographs, at least as they seemed to me, I don't know if he was really bothered about the formality of of post production or anything like that. Just something very spontaneous. And but then it's um, interesting, isn't it, that he said, at least in that little thing I quoted, that he needed to find that what came out was what he thought of, he put in, and that therefore he took up his own developing and printing. Mm. Yeah, but the, that's not to say he enjoyed it as much as actually doing the creative moment. That does make yeah. sense. Mm. 
Thank you so much. Uh, I'm looking at the time. We can carry on for a little bit. If anybody has any questions, I should have, obviously it's you know, uh, implicit that anybody who'd like to fire any questions to Janet or indeed members of the family now, now is the moment. So please do. Uh, yes. Is that Ruth Baumberg? Do, do go ahead. Yes. I knew the Baumanns quite well in the 80s and 90s. I knew nothing about his photography. Mm -hmm. I was more interested in Janina's books, which I read soon after they came out. I have a son who is a sociologist. He has a chair at King's College London. He was very excited when he started his uh, course at Cambridge, his undergraduate course. And he said, oh, we've got some books in our course by Zygmunt Bauman. And I've actually met him. He was very excited about that. <laughs> um, um, I... I'm a very keen amateur photographer myself, though most of my, I did take a lot of photos in the 50s and 60s when I was very young, I'm 82 now, but most of my photography is digital and since um, since the turn of the millennium, basically. And I'm a keen um, member of a local Leeds Photographic Society, but I knew nothing about Sigmund's photographs so I'm quite interested in how they how they were and how it is a it's a different it's a different animal photography before digital and photography afterwards yes I did some work with a friend um with an enlarger but the, the whole post-production scene is quite different today from what it was then um yes and it i don't have a lot to say about um i i'm certainly not a sociologist and i haven't read his book my husband was a had a chair at the university but in genetics so um which is how we sort of met really um that's about it well you're saying you knew them reminds me to say and i hope this is okay i don't know who's still here from the family anna and lydia perhaps about the little film that's being shown at the Jewish Film Festival. If you are still there, does either of you want to say something about Irena's film? I have not seen it, no. No, no, nobody's seen it. I don't it, think no. anybody has yet. Um, L yes. Lydia, Lydia, could you say Lydia, something? why don't you? Th thank you, Ruth. Sorry, uh, Lydia, do tell us more. Actually, when I had to go because she was uh, yes. boarding a plane somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so she had to cut off. Uh, but um, yes, it's extraordinary. Irena put forward, I mean, she's never made a film in her life. She's an architect by profession. Uh, she put she put forward a proposal as a result of an open call from the Jewish Film Festival uh, for a three or four minute um, uh, documentary uh, to do with uh, the subject of the immigrant experience in Britain. And uh, taking as a starting point the custom that my parents had of writing what they called balance sheets on every one of the wedding anniversaries. And there were 62 of those, 62 of those. So we have 62 balance sheets. Uh, they used to write down um, their plans for the next year and their conclusions about the past year. Uh, plans, ideas, um, you know, working out whether something worked well or didn't. And uh, based on these, uh, they used to have a meal out and, and my mother wrote down their thoughts in her inimitable, terrible handwriting. Uh, but um, so uh, it's a very, very, very short film. It's partly animation, partly snapshots, partly, um, uh, partly just images of those balance sheets, uh, lots of cigarette smoke, the atmosphere of, um, of, of those occasions. I haven't seen the film yet. It's it's apparently complete, and there's going to be a premiere in um, JW3 in London on the 14th of November. Uh, one of uh, one of uh, she 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 got the she got she got the obviously she was shortlisted to the last five, and the five last shortlistees made these films, and they'll be presented in the uh, in in the festival. So somebody in the chat is asking for the title of the film, and I can't remember. Lydia. It's, called the, it's called the balance sheet the basically. balance sheet Lovely. and it's being screened at the jewish film festival in leeds and manchester at well as well oh good yeah. yeah so you need to look up when i've already got my ticket for the manchester one but it's right. it's there are a, a, a limited version of the jewish film festival in both those cities yeah um, that, good. Uh, good to know good to let, know. let you know so it, it I, i'm really looking forward to seeing that yeah i mean it is interesting isn't it although both your parents lydia are known for 
the, the verbal over the visual and both of them with your mother and her ceramics and your father, the interest in sketching, then the photography. I mean, the visual played a very significant part, which has clearly come through to the next generations. Lovely. Um, last chance for questions. If there aren't any, uh, and while you're thinking about it, um, just let me say that there is, as I think Janet mentioned right at the very beginning, I should have mentioned it earlier myself, there is a, a generous discount, 30% uh, off the cover price, which is a modest £25 for starters, um, available. And I will actually send a follow-up email to everybody signed up for the event, because there may be some who didn't actually make it tonight, um, to give you the discount code. But I'll say straight away, if you do go to the Manchester University Press website, the photographs of Zygmunt Bauman and the discount code is very simply Bauman with the capital B twenty three. But as I say, I will, I will, um, uh, good. I will um, uh, write to you about that. And I'm just noticing that Laura Vaughan from UCL is actually giving the. If you go to the chat, everybody, you probably know how to do that. Uh, she gives uh, the link to that. Uh, mm -hmm. Lydia's talk, as I say, is on the YouTube channel. The Insiders Outsiders YouTube channel easily available, courtesy of Google. Um, I do mm -hmm. highly recommend it as a lovely kind of compliment in a way to this delightful session tonight and we will make sure that this recording is up there as soon as as soon as possible so do look out for that so i think no more questions no more comments very good um we'll leave it at that for tonight thank you so much everyone for being here um getting some lovely comments coming through very special thank you janet ever so much and lydia and the rest of the family likewise be well everyone and i hope to see you again in the not too distant future. bye thank you all the best good, good night everyone bye